Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. You know what time it is, so sit back and get ready for the Stafford Voice, your dose of conservative in a world of liberal. Three, two, one. Hey, how are you doing? Yes, that's right. I'm your host, Daniel Stafford, and you are tuning into the Stafford Voice, where we are conservative in a world of liberal. Holy cow, am I fired up to talk about climate change. Oh, yes, I know. Climate change really is our biggest threat, and I'm going to get into that, so just sit tight, you know, because it's, I'm, I think, I think maybe I got to start agreeing with some of these, oh, God, oh, oh it's, it, it almost makes me want to throw up when I say this, but I think I'm starting to really understand what they mean when they, when, when those liberals, the libtards, are out there claiming that climate change is the biggest threat we have to face today. So I hope that you'll tune in for the next, oh, I don't know, little bit of time, maybe a full hour if we can fit it all in. But yeah, I know it's really, really boring. So if you've got kids, go ahead, turn the TV off, shut off the video game, set them by the radio, and we'll talk about climate change. They'll be out in less than five minutes. Um, before we get into that, look, I want you to know there are a handful of ways to listen. So wherever you're at, set the channel as a favorite. Uh, whatever you have to do so you don't get left behind. Uh, if you're over wherever you're at, just hit the subscribe or the follow button or um, hit the little star, or whatever it is. Um, because for some strange, crazy reason you do miss the show, um, we want you to be able to catch a replay. Because sometimes, there there are times when we're throwing so much at you that even as a host, I gotta go back and listen to some of the stuff that we talked about to see if maybe I, <laughs> maybe I was able to get out what I wanted to say. So, um, relax, because... There's no need to panic. We've got you. Um, the The replay will be up later, um, so for your listening pleasure um, in the coming hours. Um, if you aren't already following on social media, go ahead and do so. Jump over to the Twitters. You don't have to shut the show down. You can still listen. Head on over to the Twitters. Look me up at Stafford Voice. Give me a shout out. You can either use um, hashtag TSV. Or you can tag me in it. I'll I'll find you either way. Um, you can also find me over on the Facebook. So all you got to do just search for the Stafford Voice. That's right. Click like and make sure when you do uh, that you click that little drop down and make sure that you get notifications. That's really the only way to make sure you see what goes up there. Also, if you have a story you want us to cover, or you've got a question or a comment, feel free to email me at thestaffordvoice at gmail.com. Again, that's thestaffordvoice at gmail.com. And be sure to send some love to the station and our affiliates, and stay up to date with things that are going on over at thestaffordvoice.com. Okay, before we jump into climate change and how it really is the biggest threat that we face today... Uh, let me give you a summary of what happened last week. It, yeah, it was Thanksgiving. A lot of you guys know I like food. Um, if I didn't have any type of self-restraint, I would probably be on one of those um, TLC specials, you know, 900 pounds and, and still eating or something like that. Um, but... Let me explain this. So, had a house full of family. Absolutely love them. My son, his wife came over. Um, my dad and his girlfriend were there. We had a great, great dinner. Um, turkey, stuffing, 
there was green bean casserole, there was some corns, cornbread casserole type stuff that's just absolutely amazing. Uh, there was mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, I could go on and on. There was jello, uh, but look, finally, when everybody left, it was about 7 o'clock at night. We, The wife and I, we were getting ready to sit down and watch a, a, a documentary about Joan of Arc, and it was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to spend some time researching her. Uh, I think that there's some things that um, we can talk about uh, further shows, but it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I would not have thought that a documentary about Joan of Arc would have been that neat, but it really was. Um, and even my wife commented how how interesting it was. So we'll we'll talk about that coming up in in probably uh, if we don't get it on one of the shows, what we'll do is over on the YouTube channel. We'll put to, I'll put together one of those little history shorts about Joan of Arc. So if you guys are interested in that, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, make sure you tag me at Stafford Voice and let me know that you want to know a little bit more about Joan of Arc. She was a fascinating individual. Um, so roughly it was seven o'clock uh, Central Time, and we'd finally kicked out every kicked everybody out of the house. Getting ready to sit down, I looked over at the wife and I said, "Are you ready?" She said, "For what?" I said, are you kidding me? It's time for pumpkin pie. So yes, stage one of desserts. That's right, stage one. Um, this was like three course, three courses of desserts. It was absolutely amazing. So round one was my wife's famous pumpkin pie. Abs- oh god, I would sit down and eat. I could sit down and eat the whole pie, but she makes me share it. Whatever. It's really good. Let that one settle. An hour later, we go back into the kitchen and we got out the coconut cream pie. Oh, it was heaven on a plate with coconut too. So we let that settle. An hour later, third course of dessert was a chocolate pie. I mean, I was in dessert heaven. Uh, we've killed, a, we've we've massacred all of the pies since then. So we we did it justice. But oh my goodness! Uh, I mean, we went going from pumpkin pie to coconut cream pie, and then chocolate pie. Uh, shortly afterwards, I was in a pie coma. And had to tap out, and it was over after that. So, um, I trust that everybody else had a great uh, Thanksgiving. Everybody, um, looks like everybody's starting to wake up from their food comas. Hopefully you don't have to go to the gym and uh, run it all off. But, uh Thanksgiving was absolutely fantastic. It, it was a blast. I was so glad that um, the family was able to join me at home. Um, it was a really good time. Um, already looking forward to Christmas and having a house full again. Um, so yeah, it, it was really good. I'm looking forward to Christmas. It is the season to be jolly. So I'm going ahead. go ahead and work on my little... Santa gut there. Got to catch up to the big guy. Okay, so speaking of catching up, before we get into climate change, you know, let's just go ahead and, um, let's just go ahead and get this one out of the way. And when we come back, we'll touch on climate change. Now this, going into this, it's it's going to give you a way to catch up on what was said throughout the week. It's a little thing we like to call campaign roundup, so you can stay up to date on who's saying what of those that are out there running the race. So we'll be back in just a second. (laughs) 
doesn't seem to be very many women or children in that. They actually look like mostly young, very strong men. And I'm saying, what's going on? This could be the ultimate Trojan horse. Look, we have a president, frankly, that doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have a clue. I, I mean, what, are we going to end up with World War III here because we have a president that doesn't know what he's doing? Well, again, we have a president that refuses to even use the term radical Islamic terrorism. And I do think it's worth saying that people of faith make better leaders. But having an opportunity to talk to many of the Syrian refugees themselves and ask them questions like, what is your supreme desire? And to, to see how much they want to be resettled in their own country. But also asking them, what can other nations like the United States of America do that would be helpful to you? And the answer that, uh, that really was overwhelming is that they can support the efforts that are already in place. God forbid tomorrow morning there is a terrorist attack in the United States. The first question everyone's going to have is, why didn't we know about it? And why didn't we stop it? Some in our own party who have taken away tools that we need to find these killers before they find us. It's gotten to the point where I don't think Saturday Night Live can even parody this president anymore. A couple of weeks ago, he, he went overseas and he said he's not interested in America leading. He's not interested in America winning. He doesn't have time for that. And, and now he's saying what a powerful rebuke it is to ISIS that he's going to a global warming summit. Listen, President Obama and John Kerry have both said that they think essentially your SUV in the driveway is a greater threat to our security than ISIS, than is a nuclear Iran. He still refuses to utter the words ra radical Islamic terrorism. He still has no strategy for defeating ISIS. And he still wants to bring to America tens of thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees, even after his own FBI director admitted this administration cannot vet the refugees to ensure they're not ISIS terrorists. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so we are back, and yes, I'm your host, Daniel Stafford. That was Campaign Roundup, just a short little bit to, um, to give you an idea of the some of the candidates out there and what they're saying. Um, and the last of those was... Ted Cruz and he he touched a little bit on how our president is completely flipping clueless about what to do with these um ISIS ISIL Daesh guys um it, that it almost sounds like a nursery rhyme what we have to call them because one day we got to call them ISIS the next day we got to call them ISIL and if you really want to upset them we call them Daesh so you got ISIS ISIL Daesh and it almost starts to feel like you're speaking their language. Uh, just blah, 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 blah. Okay, so climate change. So, get this. I, I'm actually starting to really understand why climate change really is our biggest threat. Because And follow me on this. Climate change is our biggest threat because... We're not worried about anything else. We're so damn focused on climate change that we're not worried about refugees. We're not worried about making sure our veterans aren't living on the streets. We're not worried about people, about the shoot up at the, at the PP corral. <laughs> and by and large, all of those are really, uh, it's like a cause and effect. Without climate change, none of those would happen. Thanks to climate change, we have ISIS, ISIL, Daesh. Thanks to climate change, we have poverty. Thanks to climate change, we have terrorism. And thanks to climate change, we have shootouts at the PP Corral. Now, what's the PP Corral? Look, we all know what the PP Corral is. The Planned Parenthood is kind of a play on thing. You, know, you, you got a guy over here that's living on the East Coast, who was living on the East Coast, in the woods, not really living in a house. At least some reports are saying that. And then he winds up making it to Colorado at some point and decides he's going to go shoot him up at the PP Corral. 
Now, if climate change wasn't real, he would have had the absolute perfect temperature to live alone in the woods and not get upset. So, we had our illustrious Obama over there in France. And last time we talked about this, we touched on how Obama says that, I think we talked about this, about how uh, this sends a clear, how how it sends a clear message to ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, that... uh, on the e or on the af- after the attack, it just sends a clear message that we're not playing their game anymore. We're standing firm and we're looking them and staring them down the eye and saying, "Climate change is real." Okay. Anyway, look, we've got some sound bites from him. From Obama, the O. And he doesn't give you that O face. You know what I mean? He doesn't give you that type of O face. It's the O. That kind of O face. Anyway, so Obama. (laughs) Yes, and I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I forgot to mention um, our chat room. We gave you two different places to, to look for it. Uh, if if you've never joined us in the chat room, please do so now. There are there are a handful of like-minded individuals just like you. Um, we've got some libertarian leaning. We've got some conservative conservative leaning. There's some Republicans. You never know. There could be a silent troll in there that's that's on the liberal side. We don't know. But two different ways you can get there k98talk.com slash chat dash room or you can go over to the staffordvoice.com slash listen live either one is going to get you there um and i was laughing because um a good good friend of mine and a uh, long time listener um slickery trigger uh many of you'll probably know him on the twitters uh at slickery trig uh he said he he was referring to Obama and he he who should not be named. I just thought that was that was funny. Um, so yeah, this guy goes over and it sounds like a really bad childhood TV show. You, you've got Bob the Builder and only he can fix it. Yes, he can, but now you've got Obama and. He's the only one that can fix it. No, he can't. So, look, this is part of the introduction that he gives. Check this out. I've come here personally as the leader of the world's largest economy and the second largest emitter to say that the United States of America not only recognizes our role in creating this problem, we embrace our responsibility to do something about it. So, uh, listen, um, America's the only ones that did this. It's all our fault. I'm sorry. Look, this a-hole is over there in France apologizing for America being a kick-ass nation. And he gives the idea that, look, he went over there on his own accord and Never mind the fact that him and his whole entourage and Horseface Carey and a whole bunch of other diplomats have flown over there in big, huge jumbo jets. And you, for crying out loud, you're going to, quote unquote, the largest climate change rally. And we have 180 or 200 nations jumping on big, huge jumbo jets, flying all over the world, emitting God knows how much carbon emissions. So he can get up there and apologize and say that he's sorry for America doing what he's done. 
or what 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 America has done because we're just so awesome that he he's so sorry and he needs to apologize for it. The only thing he needs to apologize is for leaving some little Kenyan town without their town idiot. This guy's a flipping moron. And, oh, but wait, we've got to make sure that we throw out some, uh, we've got to throw out some, some politics and, and we're, look, this is his subtle way of giving the middle finger to ISIS. And we salute the people of Paris for insisting this crucial conference go on. An act of defiance that proves nothing will deter us from building the future we want for our children. What greater rejection of those who would tear down our world than marshalling our best efforts to save it? So, he's giving the middle finger to ISIS ISIL Daesh and saying, ha ha, nanny nanny boo boo, you didn't keep us from having our climate change rally. Seriously. Um, n- I don't think so. <sighs> the guy's a complete moron. He is... He is the president of town idiots. He is the president of town idiots. It... it if town okay this is a really bad joke but yeah if town idiots got together and put forth somebody to be their representative they pick obama the biggest idiot of all i look this guy it is already asking congress for a big portion of the three billion dollar pledge so he can give it to the United Nations Fund to help countries adapt to climate change because we've got to make this a priority for poor countries so how in the hell are we going to pay for this? So, in addition to the countries that are individually pledging money, one of one of the major discussion points um, is how how this whole thing is going to be funded. And they didn't quite get to this today uh, because, well, for one, this a a hole decided he wanted to talk for as long as he did but so they they're going to try they're trying to figure out how they're going to pay for all of this and and in particular how these less developed countries can tackle climate change with the help of more developed countries like the United States like Russia like China. And what's funny is all these other little countries are saying, um, screw you, why do we have to pay for this? You're the ones that are over there blowing all that crap up into the sky. We're not paying for it. So, now they're going to bicker, they're gonna, they've got a lot to bicker about how much they're going to invest in renewable energy, how much traditional oil and gas producers uh, are going to, how much they can wind up losing in the end. Um, Because ultimately they want to get rid of emissions. They think they can do that by 2100. They think that they can knock it down. They, They think that they can get cut half the emissions by the year 2050 and completely eliminate them by the year 2100. Now, I can't think of very many listeners out there that are going to make it to 2100. 
And I'm not saying that because I don't have, because I have no compassion. I'm just saying, slow down and think about what the hell you just, you're, you're saying and what you're trying to do. Because, well, uh, and to be quite honest, America has done a better job in patrolling the pollutions that we put into the sky. We are actually doing a little better. But you've got countries like, you've got a country like China, who is the world's number one pollutant. And they don't give two craps. They don't care. So, again, back to how we're going to pay for this. So, and and it really is is a twofold thing. So you've got all these countries that wanted that that, that are going to be forced to pay for all of this, but then you've got. Um, You've got um, other initiatives out there, like the Breakthrough Energy Initiative, which is a, a, an investment, an investor group um, started by Bill Gates, I think. So, uh, who has openly pledged a billion dollars of his own money, which goes to prove that money can't buy you brains, but. You've got 19 countries who are are coming out and saying that they want to they want to double the spending on low or no carbon energy over the next 5 years. They want to bump it from 10 billion to 20 billion a year. They spend, okay? They are currently spending $10 billion. Half of that comes from the United States. Half of it. $10 billion and $5 billion of that that gets spent every year on trying to cut carbon emissions and slow the role of climate change is spent by the United States. Five billion dollars. Look, I'm going to be pretty upfront and honest. I think that there are bigger and better things we can spend as a country five billion dollars on. I think that we could probably take a look at our own selves and... um try and start paying down some debts so we can prove to the rest of the world that we're a little more fiscally responsible responsible than than just saying put it on the uh, American Express I mean you got you got guys like Mitch McConnell who are out there um he wrote uh, an op-ed uh, over for the Washington Post, and he said, uh, quote, Congress and more than half of the states have already made clear that he won't be speaking for us. But as you know, he, in his opening remarks, the Obama's opening remarks, he said that uh, he was there on his own accord. So, I mean, he he's the only one in America that's that's willing to stand up and say we've got a problem everybody else is a denier blah 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 whatever kiss it suck it whatever um, so Mitch went on to say he said that uh, it would be uh, a quote uh, irresponsible for an outgoing president to purport to sign the American people up for a new climate agreement and I totally agree why in the hell would we sign up for this anyway? Look, we're we are actually leading the charge in the world on policing our 
carbon footprint, okay? We really are. I, I know I probably sound like one of them liberal whacktards, um, but... And I'm probably coming across a little scatterbrained, but I'm still trying to figure out the whole climate change deal. Maybe we need to consult our, um, consult the one, the O. Because, you know, he, he's a man of travel, a man, not a man of, well, okay, so he is a man of mystery. Um, but at, at this conference, um, at this big rally, I don't want to call it a rally, I don't want to call it a conference, because really it's just, he's a community disruptor, he can't organize anything, but he supposedly went to Alaska, and so he he talked about his trip, so let's hear what he has to say, maybe it'll shine some light on this. This summer I saw the effects of climate change firsthand in our northernmost state, Alaska where the sea is already swallowing villages and eroding shorelines, where permafrost thaws and the tundra burns. What the hell is that? Is he the next damn Shakespeare? And the tundra burns. It sounds like, oh my word. Oh, anyway. So he supposedly went to Alaska. He saw... The, the sea rise and swallow up villages and he saw the tundra burn and I, I would actually challenge him to prove that he watched the tundras burn. Um, he went on to talk about how uh, how these icebergs are are melting faster than ever before. I not so sure that he may have missed something but the polar ice caps are getting bigger um so yeah when the polar ice caps actually start to shrink faster than we've ever been a- the, the, in record then than they have at any other time then we need to start worrying but all of this hubbub over a 20 to no it was a 30 year span back in 1980 the average global temperature get this Back in the 1980s, okay, I was still pissing in a diaper. My mom and dad were still... Yeah, anyway, that's a whole different type of show. But because we're talking about a piece of crap like Obama and his little climate change rally. Um, so, back in the 80s, Okay, in the 80s, the average global temperature compared to the average global temperature of today was half a degree cooler. Half a flippin' degree! Oh my god! We're worried about all this crap for half a degree? Holy crap! I don't know if he's ever been to the Midwest, but here in Kansas... It's in the 20s. A half a degree would make it feel like it's 50. Never mind the fact that up in Wyoming, uh, I think it was Wyoming, over the weekend, they were setting record lows of negative 11. Record cold. And we're talking about global warming record colds and we're talking about global warming but during the summertime you'll notice uh, that we start calling it global cooling because it's 
hot outside. Never mind the fact that, uh, you know what? Weather happens. Every flippin' day, weather happens. You know what? The climate's gonna change tomorrow. Holy crap! You know what they, they're predicting in uh, local weather studios here in Kansas City? This is what they're predicting. Today, we had highs in the low 30s. We're getting ready to go through a, uh, a city warming. I'm not going to call it global warming. We're going to call it city warming. City warming 2015. Yes, by the end of the week, get this. Oh my God, I'm going to have to break out my shorts because we could see high 40s. All of this is because of a half a degree. Now, most... Now, okay, so if you compare... that, Let's compare that for just a second to the world of politics and elections. During the election cycle... We look at all these stupid polls and one poll says that so-and-so is leading by this much and so-and-so is in second place with this much, but there's a margin of error of 3%. 3%. Not a half a percent. Not a half. Three. I've seen them as far as 5%. Margin of error. Now that would be equivalent to saying we've got five degrees that the global temperature has increased five degrees since 1980 until 2015. Do you ever think, stop and think that maybe the equipment there's a margin of error in the equipment? Unbelievable. But, you know what? Enough about science. And kudos to the president because he knew we would, we would bring up the whole science bit. Here's what he had to say about that. One of the enemies that we'll be fighting at this conference is cynicism. The notion we can't do anything about climate change. Yes, we're fighting cynicism, not science. Because after all, science schmience. Science says climate change is fake. Science says and proves that the polar ice caps are larger now than when Al Gore got his Nobel Peace Prize for coming up with the whole idea of climate change. Kudos to that jackass for figuring out how to make millions off of everybody. Climate change, okay? <clears throat> oh, some just the hearing the name of some people ticks me off. It really does. Oh my word. I can't stand that guy. So, certainly certainly we're, this isn't about science, it's about cynicism, okay? So, earlier I said that climate change is really is our biggest threat. Well, that's because we had to bring up those damn refugees. We had to... Here we are at the biggest climate change rally in, in history. And we have to talk about and politicize this thing and talk about Syrian refugees. Check this out. Political disruptions that trigger new conflict and even more floods of desperate peoples seeking the sanctuary of nations not their own. The desperate sanctuary of nations that are not their own? You mean to say that climate change is so big 
and so catastrophic that if we don't act now, everybody's going to have to move to America. We're going to have to bring them in. We're going to have to open our borders. You know what? We're going to have to call China and say, look, we need, to, we need your help. We've got to figure out how to, how to add on. You know, kind of like you're out there doing in the South China Sea with that whole little island thing and building that. Will you come over and help build a little more onto the side so we can accommodate everybody? Because if we can't fix climate change now, we're going to have so many more refugees. More on that towards the end of the show. But... Paving the way for cheap and clean power. Yeah, that's what this whole thing's all about. Over the last seven years, we've made ambitious investments in clean energy and ambitious reductions in our carbon emissions. We've multiplied wind power threefold, solar power more than 20-fold, helping create parts of America where these clean power sources are finally cheaper than dirtier conventional power. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. We have, as a country, spent, not not because the actual citizens of the country did, wanted to, but because Obama, because we all know that Obama is the only one that can fix this. He's the Bob the Builder of climate change and fixing this. Okay. America has spent unprecedented amounts of money on wind energy, which science, uh, again, we're, we're bringing back the whole cynicism, not science thing. Science, the science of wind energy proves it is nowhere near as effective as those big, huge, nasty buildings that send up all that nasty, dirty smoke. We've spent an unprecedented amount of money on solar companies that went bankrupt. But never mind that, okay? Because science proves solar power sucks compared to those big nasty buildings that send all that nasty smoke up. Look. If there's something out there that's going to give a cleaner world in 15, 20, 30 years then damn it, let's get working on it. It was something out of science fiction when when Kennedy challenged America to go to the moon. We had no flipping clue. We made it happen. But the whole idea that climate change... If fixing climate change is going to fix all the other problems in the world, you've got to com- be a complete moron to think that. You really do. You know what? Let let's take a quick break, and when we come back, let's let's touch a little bit on on. Um, some of these people and what they said. We'll be right back. Red Nation Rising brings you Town Hall Radio. From a single tweet to three million a month, our community is a force to be reckoned with on social media. So don't miss our show Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern on K98 Talk. Our chat room is our co-host and you ask the question. Join us and be heard. So get ready to sound off on Red Nation Rising Radio. No one else is going to do it for you.
I don't know about you, but I'm not the type of guy that jumps into anything without first doing my research. And when I was looking for a holster, I'll admit I was having one heck of a time. You know what I'm talking about here. You find one you like, you try it on, it would be clunky. Another one fits good, but costs way too much. So you try on one last holster, it was slim, lightweight, priced right, but lo and behold, you slide your pistol in, and it falls right out. So what do you do? You've tried all these mass market holsters. Well, go custom. I know what you're thinking. I thought it too. Too pricey. Wrong. My guy over at Rebel Road Tactical will not only put together the perfect fitting, hand molded, hand assembled, custom Kydex holster, but you'll get it at an affordable price. Don't wait. Contact Rebel Road Tactical today at 682-217-4579. Again, that's 682 682- Two one seven four five seven nine. Place no order. Can stop it. It's the dramatic reinvention of Top Radio. Here come the spa dolphins. The only thing that can cure racism is Robert E. Lee's penis. Who named this cat Limberfoot McCubbin? A Trump Biden debate. Plugs versus rugs. <laughs> Real serious nonsense. A show so bad you'll laugh at us. The worst podcast. We obviously hold that title. Mondays, 9 p.m. Eastern, K98 Talk. Conservative in a world of liberal. The Stafford Voice. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back and. Wow, I didn't realize there was so much to talk about about climate change. After all, we look, we all know that climate change is the biggest problem that the world is facing right now. <laughs> Whatever. So, to back that claim up, I've pulled a couple of quotes from some of the uh, from some of the, the the big names out there. So you got Prime Minister David Cameron who said, quote, We all know exactly what is needed to make a good deal here in Paris. We need a deal that keeps two degrees alive. We need a deal with a binding legal mechanism. A deal that has a five-year review so we can see how we're doing. A deal for the poorest and most vulnerable countries in terms of finance. So, let me, in my three minutes, take this argument the other way around not what we need to succeed we all know that but let's just imagine for a moment what we could what we would have to say to our grandchildren if we failed we'd have to say it was all too difficult and they would reply well what was so difficult what was it that was so difficult when the world was in peril Here's another one. Prince Charles. Right. If the planet were a patient, we would have treated her long ago. You ladies and gentlemen have the power to put her on life support, and you must surely start the emergency procedures without further procrastination. Humanity faces many threats, but none is greater than climate change. In damaging our climate, we are becoming the architects of our own destruction. We have the knowledge, the tools, and the money to solve the crisis. Rarely in human history have so many people around the world placed their trust in so few. Your deliberations over the next two weeks will decide the fate not only of those alive today, but also of generations yet unborn. <laughs> Oh, gosh, these are face palms, people. Face palms. These people are idiots. Now you've got French President Francois Hollande. Never have the stakes of an international meeting been so high because it concerns the future of the planet, the future of life. The hope of all humanity rests on all of your shoulders. Okay, so let me go back to something that... that uh, um, Prime Minister Cameron said he, he wanted to take his three minutes to make his argument about the other way. What, what are we doing to our grandchildren? Oh, I almost teared up with that. So, yes, everyone was given three minutes, but 
Obama had different ideas. We all know that. He doesn't play by the rules. He is... He's Obama. He does what he wants. Okay, so... More than eight and a half minutes into his address without any flipping sign that he was going to stop soon they they sound there was this dude he sounded three beeps across the auditorium and everybody heard it okay everybody everybody that was watching tv or or however you were watching and these beeps continued every 30 seconds but the Obama just, like a snowplow in the Midwest, just plowed on. And after 11 minutes, 11 minutes, whoever was in charge of that damn beep button gave up. 14 minutes, the a-hole in chief, Obama, talked. So get this, they did the math and... Of all of the 147 speakers took that long, it would have lasted 33 hours to fit everybody in. Okay? So, he knew full well that they were going to only be given three minutes. And he didn't care because his prepared remarks that, that the White House actually released were more than 1,700 words. Oh, holy cow, you know, oh my goodness, wow, we need like another 30 minutes for tonight, or hour, um, so, let me touch on this for just a second, if climate change is the biggest threat to all of humanity right now, then this study put out by the Institute for Economics and Peace titled Global Terrorism Index of 2015, okay? They listed the top five deadliest terrorist groups, okay? Topping out the list, having caused 6,644 deaths, Boko Haram. They, they actually had 453 terrorist incidents. Number two was ISIL, ISIL, ISIS Daesh. They have caused 6,073 deaths. Now, okay, again, these numbers were um, from, the, the numbers were tallied from 2014 and this was released this year. So, they've caused 6,073 deaths, a total amount of terrorist incidents accumulated to 1,071. They've injured more than 5,000 people. Just injured 5, 000, more than 5,000. Number three was the Taliban. They've caused 3,477 deaths with a whopping 891 incidents. Number four was the Fulani militants. 1,229 deaths in only 154 incidents. And then we've got number five, which is an Al-Qaeda um, offshoot, Al-Shabaab. 1,021 deaths by 496 terrorist incidents. Okay? Every single one of these groups has one thing in common. One thing. And one thing only. All five of these groups, not only did they give two craps about climate change, but they are all fundamental Islamics. They are Islamic fundamentalists, and they have caused more deaths than climate change. But we're supposed to believe that climate change is the biggest the biggest threat to humanity? I don't think so. 
Okay, now I, I was trying to save a little bit of time before we went to break. Um, but I don't think we're going to get to... I don't think we're going to have enough time for break. Um, so before before we do the um, the campaign roundup, can I just remind you guys about our good friends over at RWNJ Funding? Honestly, I cannot say enough good things about these guys. They not only do they do they give the middle finger to the PC to the to politically correct game and charade. The, these guys hold true to conservative and libertarian ideals, okay? They reflect constitutional values in everything they do. They're not going to cancel your campaign because you offended somebody. That's just not who they are, okay? So I believe in these guys so much that at the start of the new year, I will be using... RWNJ funding to um wow I totally forgot what the uh, stupid thing is called anyway we're gonna put together the the funding for the 2016 year uh, pledge drive that's what we're doing we're doing a pledge drive and we're hosting it through RWNJ funding starting at the uh, at the start of January. So look out for that. That's how much I believe in these guys. I wouldn't want to do a business with any other crowdfunding site. Only RWNJ Funding. You can find out more information over at RWNJFunding.com. Again, that is RWNJFunding.com. Head over there and start your campaign today. So I want to get into this real quick. And Sergeant John is going to kick me in the hind end for not doing the On This Day in History, um, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. On This Day in History, we had 1780, in 1787, Federalist Number 14 was published, written by James Madison under the pseudonym um, Publius, Publius, however you say it. Fascinating. Go look it up. Go read it. Um, there is a ton of great information in there. Okay, so let me get into the uh, who said that. We are running so short on time that we're not going to have enough time to bring the whole thing in. So hopefully I can get it figured out into the spot where we need it. Well, I think we heard some very powerful speeches uh, from President Obama, from François Hollande. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what I'm hearing, particularly from delegations from the developing world, is we need specifics. Uh, you know, the, these, these summits are always places where leaders make powerful speeches. Um, we haven't heard um, uh, a lot of detail about how we're going to get there. It seems like we're moving away from uh, a legally binding agreement. Um, so at, at the same time as we hear a lot about the need for ambition and how the world is hanging in the balance, we're kind of getting the opposite message. Everything is supposed to be voluntary. Um, we know that doesn't work terribly well when it comes to regulating corporations. Uh, and uh, in terms of what François Hollande said about these two threats, actually, I think it would have been more powerful for him to talk about how uh, war, conflict, terrorism, and climate change are actually interconnected, that the same forces uh, are driving both, um, that the Middle East has been destabilized uh, in part because of the West's mm. desire for fossil fuels. So here we have Naomi Klein, who is saying that terrorism and climate change are connected, and these guys are out there doing what they're doing, are doing what they are doing because of climate change. Now you heard Bernie Sanders, what was that, two weeks ago? Bernie Sanders explained to us how climate change is causing... Uh, droughts over in Syria and these that's why everybody wants to flee Syria is because they need a new place to go farm and and grow tomatoes and corn and all their other crap that they grow or whatever they grow nobody even knows so who is Naomi Klein well not only is she a climate activist she is the author of this changes everything and this was from a CNN interview just today um, this lady was a complete flippin' moron that just goes to show you can spin anything which way you want, but the facts will still remain. 
These people don't give two craps about climate change. They're not ticked off because they can't grow a good tomato. They're not ticked off because their onions aren't growing. They're not ticked off because the rabbits keep eating everything. I am. I mean, damn, rabbits ate everything out of my garden this year. Oh. This lady was so completely stuck on stupid. I really don't have any more words for her other than good night. Um, but you know what? That is all the time we have for this week. And God willing, the Stafford Voice, I, your host, Daniel Stafford, will be back next week. You can follow me over on Twitter at Stafford Voice. Look me up on Facebook by searching for the Stafford Voice. Email your questions, comments, or stories you want us to look at to the Stafford Voice at gmail.com. Again, that's the Stafford Voice at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your time, and until next week, thanks and God bless.